and we'll go there. And, and we can then call on you that way. Right now, we don't have a lot going on. I don't see anybody's interest. One of the things uh, I think you saw is that a lot of our talks talked about how to learn action models. And I think uh, one of the th interesting things is how that's sort of under different situations, uh, whether it's from advice through exploration or whatever. And so I think one of the things we'll be doing is trying to bring together those different ideas into a, uh, a little working paper so that uh, everybody, at least at Michigan and anybody else who is interested has a good idea about the different approaches we're taking. So it's sort of getting them out here in the workshop has sort of made that, that pretty clear. Um, any questions or uh, people have? So if you don't care, I actually have some follow-ups on some of the questions I didn't get to answer about event cognition stuff. Okay. All right, so one thing that I think was pretty interesting slash important and I didn't get to go into enough detail. Uh, Nate was asking like, why should a long-term memory system give the agent goals, right? Um, in my mind, there's sort of a gap where we assume the agent has goals. Often we give the agent goals, but we don't usually describe where the goals come from unless we're talking about natural language instruction. Uh, is that fair? But anyway, I wanted there to be autonomous goal learning in the agent I was describing, and I just wasn't able to go into enough detail about it. Uh, I consider the problem similar to intrinsic reward in reinforcement learning. I think there's this notion of intrinsically motivated exploration. The mechanism I'm describing is hopefully to provide that same kind of thing to SOAR. Um, why from ETMEM and not like SMEM? Well, uh, it gets complicated. So in my mind, there was a notion that somehow in the agent's long-term memory, there would be data for, this looks like an interesting state. Maybe you should make it into a goal. I think naturally episodic memory is accumulating sort of repeated instances of subsets of the state over time. And so it's naturally suited to say like, that's a surprising aspect of the state you should make as a goal. I'm not, I'm not certain. Nate, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, mine was just stolen, which was, I, I wasn't going to point to SMEM specifically as much as why, why is your memory telling you what to do without any other aspect? Uh, this might just be the control freak in me. But the idea that my memory is popping something and I must now listen to it. Um, it, it feels like you're, you're being a little softer about it, which is to say that the memory can come up with interesting things that may turn into goals via reasoning or something like that. But um, that's a better way to put it, actually. It, it's more like prospective. It's saying, hey, maybe this is a good goal if you're looking for a goal. I'm thinking of SOAR's. Uh, state no change impasses uh, where the agent doesn't have anything to propose. Sometimes that's because there isn't a goal. I think in those instances, memory could offer a suggestion. That's a, probably a better way to put it. And is it offering or do you ask and the memory now has this way of uh, offering the ability to provide interesting things on demand? Well, so that comes down to whether or not I implement this as a spontaneous retrieval or a queued retrieval. Uh, I'm not sure yet. 
Um, this is Bob Mariner. I think that there probably is a place in the architecture for spontaneous retrieval. I think that's something that we haven't really explored much before, and it would be really interesting to see how useful that is. And there's also a question from Bob Ray in the chat. Great, Bob. Well, Bob, I'm going to, if I can find you in the list of attendees, I'm going to allow you to talk. So if you unmute yourself, you can ask the question. Great. One, two, three. Yep. Yeah, so I was just curious, uh, as someone who really hasn't had a lot of opportunity to use uh, many of the SOAR versions, especially since SOAR 9.2 or 3 or so, you know, are there new application domains that come to mind that are particularly relevant for these new capabilities? And, uh, you know, I'm thinking mostly about places where we could uh, build some new AI applications as opposed to like just a test, or well, as opposed to a test bed for research. Was that a hard question? <laughs> I, I, were you asking me? me? I'm sort of going to let other people answer that. I, mean, I, I, th I think it's a question for anyone, but I'm just I'm curious if if things come to mind for people. Well, I think the work I've been doing with language, um, you know, there's a lot of the newer stuff in SOAR that I think is uh, very important for that and. I think, you know, language comprehension can be a big part of a, a lot of the kinds of applications that Mike was talking about recently. So that's one possibility. Also, um, I guess I can jump in. Um, I think a lot of the um, connections to, um, sorry if you hear the lawn work outside, to the connections to um, non-symbolic uh, memories and types of reasoning um, should have some really interesting um, connections to applications in uh, robotics or things with actual sensors, um, real world real world things, which I know are still often very uh, researchy, but it would be cool to see SOAR controlling um, more, uh, even more real world systems than it already does. Something that sticks out to me, um, people talked about different kinds of action models and people also talked about potentially having more non-symbolic continuous information uh, stored in memory systems. I think collectively that could result in, I don't know, more robust uh, implementations in some like robotic embodiments. Are there questions or topics people want to bring up? Or, I mean, Bob, what did you have any thoughts on that? I mean, I know you asked the question, but you can also provide some answers. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I think a lot about, you know, um, yeah, essentially the assistant space. Um, and right, I mean, all of us interact with Google or Siri or something. And it feels like that, you know, none of these tools have episodic memory uh, or their their notion of episodic memory is, you know, not very developed in terms of the way that we think about episodic memory working in humans. And so, you know, I think some combination of natural language understanding like Peter's working on and uh, and and episodic memory feels like to me that, you know, 
if I have an assistant that I'm really going to rely on, it has to be assistant that sort of knows something about the way that I live my life and the patterns more than just the kind of the, the statistical patterns of my life. Um, so I don't know whether there's a, you know, if that's a good application domain or not. I remember seeing Tom's, Tom Mitchell's uh, demo of the coffee buying agent, uh, which was kind of cool. And that feels like to me that, you know, could be a good good thing to exercise episodic memory that uh, wouldn't require like lots of perception action that that you have to do with robots. So that's, if I had, you know, a lots of free time, I would probably f fiddle around in that space. I want to make a comment on Stephen's um, idea about goals. Um, so I think uh, memory provides um, content for goals and uh, a way to represent goals. Goals have to be represented somewhere. So memory is um, a way to do that. Um, but it has to be more than memory because goals are um, something that is attractive in some way or interesting or worth pursuing. And for that, we need um, evaluate, I would call it a valuation system or a value system. It could be uh, affect, or it could be emotions, motivation, something like that, that determines what of those representations in memory is worth pursuing. Do you, do you mind if I preach a little? Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> so in reinforcement learning, they have intrinsic reward, right? So for a while, people think of it extrinsic reward, like, all right, we have this reward signal, that we're giving and that's how the signal the uh, system's going to learn but then you can have notions of a system that does stuff like uh it rewards itself based on its estimate for how empowering a state appears and that's a form of intrinsic reward um i think ultimately intrinsic reward is how you implement intrinsic motivation in a reinforcement learning system more generally, there's this notion of intrinsic motivation. That's sort of what they call it when they're studying humans. And uh, so the, the real question is what makes you motivated to pursue a goal, right? Uh, the reinforcement learning people consult information theory. There are certain measures of things like surprise, empowerment, stuff like that. And they use those measures to derive a formula for their intrinsic reward functions. I think you can do something similar, but it would be more in terms of how you access memory instead of how you calculate a reward. Does that, does that make sense? It's a little bit of a rant. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's, I, I just wanted to say that you need both. You need a way to represent it and you need a way to select um, what's represented. So it, it makes sense. So we had one question on the chat, which was, uh, when can we download the recording of this session? Well, I don't know. Um, I, um, after this, uh, I'll get the video. Um, I just don't know when I'm going to have a chance to, uh, you know, chop it into the individual talks. It will be posted on the SOAR, work, uh, SOAR website at Michigan. Um, and there was a question about the GitHub repository links for all the speakers. Uh, all the Michigan speakers, uh, we use uh, the GitHub that Stephen just posted to the chat window. Uh, I think on uh, Bob's talk, he listed the repository for SORTEC for JSOR. So I think uh, there are ways to do that. We also hope to post uh, copies of the slides um, that once again, just will take a while for us to collect all those and to make them available. I promoted everyone who's remaining to a uh, part of the, as a panelist. So you can, if you want, you can turn on your video or you can unmute and ask a question and um, sort of we'll make this a free for all for a while um, until, uh, unless it gets a little bit uh, chaotic. But for now, if anybody wants to just unmute and ask a question, go ahead or make a comment. This is Bob Mariner. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, you're good. 
<clears throat> so I guess a, a comment that I have uh, that in, in terms of, sorry, my video covers on, a comment that I have in terms of um, things that say people at U of M could do to help support J, future JSTOR development without like say diving in and actually writing Java code or whatever, like uh, things that would you could do to make CSOR better that would make it easier to port things into JSTOR um, would be, um, I think that, you know, and this makes perfect sense because you guys are working on the oftentimes internal kernel structures themselves, uh, what's happening is it's like, you know, to you it's no big deal to recompile SOAR five times a day if you want to as you're tweaking different things, right? And so there's a lot of things that say from a, uh, you know, real world enterprise level application perspective, like recompiling the code is just not an option generally speaking. And so, um, for example, one of the reasons we haven't ported SVS yet is because it doesn't support um, uh, like user definition of new spatial relationships. You can do that, but you have to recompile the kernel <laughs> to do it, right? And so, uh, in another example, uh, there's support for registering user right-hand side functions through SML but it's actually a very limited version of right-hand side functions that can only return strings and can only take, I think, a single string argument, um, which, you know, you can pass multiple things, you just have to parse it or whatever. But this is very different than the native, like internal SOAR uh, support for right-hand side functions, which can return actual symbols or multiple symbols. So you can like have things that return entire structures, for example. And the only way to write something like that is again, to recompile the kernel. And so um, those are the kinds of changes I could imagine in the future that um, would not only make uh, CSOR more powerful and attractive, but would also make it easier to bring things over to JSOR. Because like, if I'm gonna put SVS in JSOR, it has to have support for registering uh, custom relationships, in which means like right now, since that's not in CSOR, I have to invent a way to do that. And hence, it's never going to happen. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say never, but it's unlikely to happen anytime soon. So, so is it, I'm one of those people that compiles the kernel. If I'm doing, you know, actual work, <laughs> I'm compiling the kernel probably 20 times a day <laughs> just because I can. Is your point that if I have two ways to do something, <laughs> one is Oh, no big deal. Just put a new function in and compile the kernel again. <laughs> or, you know, five minutes of extra work. I could have this be something where you don't have to do that. I should pick option B. Is that your point? <laughs> um, I mean, that's part of it. I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Uh, there are some things that should be part of the kernel and should be compiled. Like if you're talking about fundamental, you know, abstract memory features or working memory activation or something like that should be in the kernel and be compiled, et cetera. But I think that part of it also uh, is thinking about how is someone who's not a researcher within the SOAR group going to want to use SOAR? And a lot of you have never been a person like that before because you're still students. Um, and I certainly, when I was in the SOAR group, uh, had that same mentality. It's like, this is how you do it. Compiling is no big deal. What's the problem? Uh, and now that I don't live in that world, uh, I realize that it is a big deal. And so, uh, so anyway, um, it's just more of a of thinking about how other users, potential users of the architecture or your new subsystem or command or whatever it is that you're adding uh, might want to interact with it. And a lot of that does mean allowing for easier configurability besides recompiling the kernel. That's all I'm done. <laughs> Something I wanted to say that I forgot to say in my talk, I talked about various uh, experimental extensions we were making to the SOAR kernel, but I neglected to mention the fact that I haven't written any of that C++ code myself, and Stephen Jones is the one that has done all that wonderful work and I just want to give him the credit. Thank you, Peter. But while we're at it, Nate, 
I don't have to tear down most of your stuff. Uh, good job. Don't get me started on the episodic memory implementation. <laughs> <laughs> you are free not to use it, Bob. It's um, not actually, I had a quick part. question. It's modifying it part. Um, and uh, feel free to tell me, I was in and out of meetings, so I might've just missed it. But on the transformer talk, I was curious why, why it's transformers as opposed to um, sequence to sequence models or function approximators or something like that. Why is it this one specific currently hot thing? Was, was there something unique about this or? Um... So um, my co uh, authors, well, Bob's here. So here is going to be my take, and then we can see what Bob has to say about it. So the idea is not that we want to use a specific kind of neural architecture. Um, I actually am completely um, agnostic on that. But what I want is I want somebody else to spend $10 million and two weeks or a month training one of these systems, and then I don't know if they're gonna give it to me or what, but that there's a system out there that has all this knowledge encoded that has certain properties of say completion or, or whatever. And that we then can very uh, easily customize it by training on top of what's already there. So that's the uh, possibility that seems to be there with transformers, especially the fact that uh, these, companies are uh, you know, doing this tremendous investment that we would never be able to do on our own. So it's trying to take advantage of what people have already done. And that seems to be something that's gonna continue on in the future. So let's ride that as opposed to build, you know, say we're gonna use this other kind of neural net and we will train it. No, I don't wanna do that. I wanna have a system that maybe we can train on a specific application um, that already knows a lot of stuff, but I don't want to be the ones building it. It's like, I'm not going to build psych or whatever. I'm going to, you know, take something that's I can already use. So I'll have to say just pre-trained net, pre-trained model for which there, there are many out there, but. Well, but there's nothing like the mo GPT-3, there's nothing, G there's nothing like that out there anymore, any place else that I know of. I mean, I, that's not available to me right now anyway, but the promise seems to be uh, pretty interesting. Um, have you ever considered doing like a crowdsource thing for like to get information for SOAR? Like mechanical Turk, like asking questions and then using that feedback. So kind of using like human neural net. Well, you did that, Eula. The extent of what's in these uh, transformer models is way beyond what you could get through Mechanical Turk in terms of the source documents that they have uh, been putting into this these systems. So um, it's just a it's it's orders of magnitude difference in terms of what's available. Bob, you can you say anything? You're, can, you're can, I, can I say something? That's the question. Uh, yeah, so to, to, to Nate's question about, you know, why GPT-2 uh, or a transformer in particular, I mean, one of the reasons that that came up in our conversations with John is that we've actually been using GPT-2 for knowledge extraction, not, not using SOAR, but just essentially coming up with some uh, mechanisms for extracting knowledge you know, Charles mentioned sort of the is a relationship. So we've been using that in a different domain application than what we talked about today to essentially try to extract that information out of GP2 too. So we have, you know, some evidence that there's some world model knowledge that can be extracted from those systems. So, so that's one of the advantages of them. And there may be other different architectures from which we could extract similar amounts of knowledge. It's for, at least for, for us, it's just familiarity. We've been working with it for two or three years already. Um, and then to the question about crowdsourcing, I was just going to mention, I, 
uh, I can't remember whether the specific approach you saw or not, but, but we've actually done some experimentation on Mechanical Turk in the interactive task learning space to actually get lots of people to interact with an agent that's trying to learn how to do a task, both to get a sense of what the variety of inputs are gonna be. So it's not just one person telling you how to do the task, it's learning the task from a hundred different people or a thousand different people and seeing what kind of variations arise. So more from a testing perspective than a knowledge elicitation perspective, but, uh, but, but very useful in that context. Um, this is kind of a follow-up question about the transformer stuff still, but philosophically, I should, I should set up philosophically, doesn't it make a little bit more sense to, if you want to use transformers and like have it built into SOAR, like have it connected to SOAR and learn with the agent rather than like just taking a pre-made database and like kind of downloading it into the agent's head, so to speak. Yes, both. I mean, so I think it's good to start with something that's been pre-learned, but the hope would be also that so in the in the best of all possible worlds, uh, this would either be able to replace or be a supplement to semantic memory so that um, some of these, the newer systems seem to be able to do few shot learning. Um, so if you could use them similar to the way we use semantic memory and to store things in and then be able to get them back out in the future, then maybe, uh, we could replace uh, semantic memory or, you know, supplement it so that the system actually is going out to multiple memories and seeing what comes back. Um, the challenge, of course, is that I mean, I'm not sure, but it might require, you know, $100,000 worth of hardware for each SOAR agent to have the new GPT-3s um, associated with them. So there, there's some trade-offs here. I don't know, other people know more than me, I mean, uh, I assume, but that's just one of the interesting aspects to think about. Um, and I think if, the other thing is sort of not having our head in the sand is to, uh, you know, be open to these new ideas and just see how, uh, keep, keep asking, how can what's going on in these other fields, other fields being other art parts of AI, um, how can that uh, be incorporated into uh, cognitive architecture? And I agree that um, it would be great to go beyond, uh, you know, just having something that's read only, but it would be, you know, write, write and read. Yeah, I'm definitely, curious. just to be clear, I'm not like opposed to neural networks or anything. I'm just like a learning along the way is a, is, a, is a fun idea. I'm curious what people think about uh, embodiment and stuff like GPT-2 and 3, because if we have a SOAR agent and that SOAR agent has an embodiment grounded meaning for certain things, and we have this sort of disembodied world knowledge that's very good in one of these models, it seems like the challenge would be how do we get that world knowledge and actually ground it to our particular agent's embodiment? Because if we have an autocomplete sentence that relies on a notion of red, and our agents' sensors are black, white. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's a simplified example, but I'm just curious. No, I, I have like opinions about that because it's like one of my biggest gripes with GPT in general is, you know, it's not embodied. And so like the things, the words that it comes up with don't actually connect with anything in the real world to it. Like they have well, meaning. It, yeah, it's right. relationally correct though, right? In, in terms of the relationships between things it's going to be correct but it's not grounded to an embodiment is that a problem like it, is that actually I mean, bad we can still use like, it definitely yes like um i mean i think that's what is a real issue and that um having the system being able to learn new language um is going to be a challenge for it to be able to you know make contact between its knowledge and the knowledge in these systems. So it will get back things from GPT-3 or 2 or whatever from a transformer that will be words that the agent itself has never seen anything about before. And it might have to do another query to try to then finally find connections between those words and words that it already knows. So uh, part of this will be how can the system, I think, build up its vocabulary 
um, of grounded meaning so that its own grounded meanings can then have connections to these systems. And so I think that's a great, that's really a, a great thing. Uh, before we go on, Peter uh, suggested that everybody turn on their video that has it, and then we can sort of take a picture. Um, we usually have a picture, uh, <laughs> Stevens in the, has taken the pose uh, at a sort of workshop of everybody outside. Uh, so it'd be great to be able to do one today. So um, please don't be shy. Um, everybody else, if you could turn on your video and we'll see if uh, the internets don't crash. So that would be, of course, this is causing people to leave, but <laughs> <laughs> because they're so shy. But if you could just turn on your video, um, we'll get a picture of you and we promise um, it will be posted far and wide on the internet. So we got a few more people. It would be great. Dustin, if you, Dave, great. Great to see you, Dave. About Stella, Mazin, Stephen, James. You can you might just have to call it after a certain yeah. time. Well, John's using all of his teacher skills that he can. <laughs> I'll count to three. <laughs> That's my parenting oh skills. <laughs> You'll get a timeout. I don't know what that means here. All right. So, can somebody uh, take a picture? I mean, isn't that being recorded? Yeah, but <laughs> everybody, I don't know. Everybody, we raise our hands. So somebody uh, do a print screen. We have to all do this at the same time, all right? I know. <laughs> One, two, three, hands up. Who's going to do the print screen? Could, uh, did anyone do it? No one did it, but it's recorded. We'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Hey, hold on. This oh, is you know, tell everybody to put their hands in the air. You know. Well, like they don't hear. Okay, hold on. The Windows My... snipping tool lets you put a delay on the snip. Okay. New. Wait. Oh. Oh. Hold so on. So we did delay. a test run. All right. We're gonna do Windows snip. We're gonna take a window. Oh. Okay. That's not. That's not a one second delay. That was definitely less than one second. Uh, all right, we're gonna do like three seconds. Uh, this window delay. Okay, never mind. This doesn't work at all. All right. Okay, James, you're gonna be the one who doesn't have their hands up. So, uh, one. Okay, are you ready, James? So take two screenshots, one with your right <laughs> hand up, one with your left hand up. So get one up. hand up, James. That's what we're doing. Okay, one. Oh, one, two, three. Everybody have their hands up. Okay. Okay. Great. Academic research. Uh, we actually do have a real question. <laughs> you get both screenfuls. So no. uh, we have a question. No, um, I didn't get both screenfuls. Try the other screenful. There's no. It's all on one screen for me. Oh yeah, it's all on one screen for me now. Okay. I just had it in like the minimus, not the minimus, uh, not quite full. I oh, oh any, this uh, is a good question, actually. Nate, I think this is on you and me. Um, <laughs> okay, all right, do we need to do another one, James? Yeah, one more, real quick. One. Hold on, hold on. I gotta get ready. All right, all right. Uh, get ready, get set. All right. So we do have a serious question. Uh, you want to answer it, ask it. Um, okay. Is there a way to represent the knowledge that a SOAR agent has in a graph database like Neo4j and manipulate the knowledge from there? Okay. Well, so if you're me, the convenient way is there is an underlying database in SQL Lite. And you can, if you are intimately familiar with the SOAR kernels indexing and everything, directly modify that database file. That's bad. Don't do that. Um, well, that only is the semantic memory. So um, yeah, it's very there, difficult to. 
there's yeah. episodic memory, there's procedural memory. Right, yeah. There are ways to back those up, uh, but as far as I know, we don't generally have them integrated with uh, other graph database representations. However, Nate, am I wrong? There was just a quick, um, at some point this feature existed, I don't know if it still does, of producing an output for visualization purposes. While it wouldn't be in the O4J directly, it's a little nicer than either SQLite or, or running your own thing. So there was um, dot format output. Does that still exist by any chance? So actually Mazin worked on this and made it better. Uh, we have a visualize command and it can be used to visualize different memory contents. Uh, yeah, that's probably the way to go actually. Um, if this were a sort tech project that was going to do this um, and we were using JSTOR anyway, it's actually really easy just to iterate over all of working memory, for example, and you can pull out the graph structure from there and reproduce it whatever you want. And then for the other memories, you know, upside and semantic memory, um, they're as easy in JSTOR as they are in CSOR because they're direct ports. Um, and then uh, for production memory, we'd have to decide what a graph representation of that means. I was going to say something about the previous question about embodiment. I think embodiment is really important. I've read a lot of literature about that related to language understanding and, and other things. I think if you think about it, how much of everything you know is representable in text? And probably a lot, but there's a lot that's not. You have a lot of nuances that are based on, uh, you know, details of, of visual perception and other kinds of perception and even conceptual models of things that you don't have an easy way to convert the language and all these transformers and things like that are based only on language input they're not grounded to anything else so these other kinds of human knowledge that aren't textual in nature are kind of left out and well, I mean, yeah. I think oh. that's particularly important. Sorry, this is part of my gripe with, with transformers. It's particularly important when you like, if you ask sort of like, oh, what is the feeling of like being hot? Like the, the transformer can like give you a sentence which makes sense, but may not be like what the agent is actually feeling at the moment, you know, like to have an understanding of what it means to be hot or cold or to be uncomfortable or to be in pain or whatever requires embodiment. And you can come up with a perfectly coherent sentence, which isn't the right thing to say. But on the other hand, if you ask what's different between, let's go with 2019 as opposed to 2020. 2020 has gotten a little bit odd. But let's go with 2019, then uh, 0, 019. And one of the things is we have lots and lots of knowledge that is transmitted uh, via text as culture from people to people. Uh, a lot of the learning you do um, in college and post-college and stuff like that, well, and in, in high school is by reading things or by talking to people. And so natural language does end up being a very important part of that in terms of the symbols that are there. So um, there's a lot, there's a lot there um, I mean, and so and and so I think that uh, sure there's a lot of our that's important to us which is how things are grounded to our senses and to um, our bodies but there's also a lot that is independent of that and you could argue that uh, you know what has made a difference in culture over the years I would say is skewed more to the un ungrounded knowledge than the grounded knowledge. But well, I know I don't know about culture so much as like science or or, or understanding of the world. Like, fine. like certainly well, let's go. I'll, I'll be willing to restrict myself to science. Well, supposing supposing you wanted to 
put knowledge into your system about everything that happened in the SOAR workshop today. And the only way you could get the input was to have a transcription of what people said, but you couldn't see the slide. You think you'd be losing anything? Well, how about if we had, uh, I so, sure, we'd be losing some things. Um, yeah, but maybe, you know, in the future, one of the things we'll be, have is transformers that can understand di diagrams. Well, that's well, possible. But another aspect of it is uh, there's a lot of research in cognitive linguistics that says that these abstract ideas that are often represented in text are derived from embodied experience that is gradually, we, we project it sort of in a metaphoric way onto more and more abstract levels, but it's based in the embodied experience. And it's kind of like building a skyscraper without any foundation when you don't have the embodied experience there. Well, I actually uh, want to get there's some truth to that, but there's also people that are blind that are able to uh, get information and have never been able to see in their lives and still uh, can build up uh, without that foundation. Well, but often that when people foundation, they don't have vision, but they yeah. have experience of space. Yeah, the movement of their bodies and, and interacting with things. Like often you'll hear people talk to their, like, like in particular, I have a blind friend who I'm thinking of, who like enjoys when people describe colors in ways which they can understand. Like, oh, you know, like red is kind of like the heat of a sunset and like the glow, of, like the warmth of a fire and like, if that makes any sense. So like you still, they still ground them in perception. And I don't think that like transformers aren't fully able to do this. I just think like text-based alone transformers are like lacking. Well, yeah. Not, not that this is about it. Like, I want to be clear. I'm not like boohooing this idea, um, at least in the short term. But I think that like, it's, you know, it needs a little bit of robustness to it. There's a body of, em of embodied cognition research. And it sort of takes the extreme position that perception is made out of affordances and that when you perceive something like, let's say color, what you're really perceiving is the ability to discriminate your action on the basis of color. So if I look at over here and I see like this blue light, I'm not seeing blue, I'm seeing the ability to make my eyes move dependent on the presence of blue over there in a specific location. Now it's getting a little, you know, it's being a little bit, I don't know, overly philosophical. But what it comes down to is that relational knowledge without an embodiment, there's no action. And so however you solve that problem, it can be like, oh, we have this wonderful knowledge base. Boom, how, here's how it connects to an embodiment. We've solved the problem. Point is, at the end of the day, if you want an interesting agent that does something, you do have to solve embodiment. I guess the question is, is there enough knowledge in something like GPT-2 that you can make the embodiment part of the problem trivial, or is that not the case? Well, it's not, we're not, we're not looking to make it trivial. Um, just, I'm not saying we are, I'm just. So, yeah. Uh, looking at the clock on the wall, actually on the computer, uh, it's now five o'clock. And so uh, we're running things on time. I guess it's 4.59. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everybody who's left. And I want to thank everybody who did uh, presentations. Uh, and please, if you uh, could upload your presentations onto the SOAR registration website, that would be greatly appreciated so we can make them available to people. Uh, so anyway, thanks again. And reminder, there's another symposium tomorrow. So uh, the Virtual International Symposium on Cognitive Architecture starts tomorrow, bright and early at 10 o'clock. So hope to see you all there. And uh, once again, thanks a lot. We're gonna consider this the end, at least for the recording.